And so the first thing about the Sharia, if you are to enforce the Sharia, is that there must be no law above the Sharia. What Allah has made halal must be preserved as halal. No one must have the authority to make it haram. No one. So there can be no law above the Sharia. I think that is something easy for Ikhwan al Muslimun to answer, to understand. If you can understand it here in Sungai Bulu, why can't they understand it in Egypt? Is it possible today, my dear Ikhwan al Muslimun, is it possible to enforce the Sharia in Egypt as the supreme law? Is it possible? No, not at all. As you say in Malay, tabule. Why? Because this is the modern age. And in the modern age, you now have something called the United Nations Organization. Have you ever heard about it? Ikhwan! And the United Nations Organization has a charter, the charter of the UN. And the charter gives to the Security Council of the United Nations supreme authority in the world on all matters pertaining to war and peace and security, international peace and security, and they will define what is peace and security. You can't define it. So if Allah in the Quran gives a command and the security council gives a different command which one will prevail? Come on Ikhwan answer me This is Sharia That is the charter of the United Nations When you become a member state of the United Nations you accede to the charter and you therefore voluntarily accept that you will obey the Security Council of the United Nations. Regardless of whether the order of the Security Council is in conflict with the Sharia or not. So it is not possible to escape from the conclusion that international law prevails over the Sharia in the modern world. Well then, what do we need to enforce the Sharia? You need to have a territory which recognizes Allah's sovereignty and in which therefore there will be no law above Allah's law. What was this territory called in the past? Whatever be the name, it's not important. But it was called Darul Islam. It was called Darul Islam. So long as you remain a modern state and a member state of the United Nations organization, your attempt to enforce the Sharia can only be cosmetic and that is an insult to Allah and to his messenger. It's better not to put your hand in that pot rather than to make it into something that is unpalatable for Muslims. Yes. Is it possible to restore Darul Islam today? If you want to restore Darul Islam today, you must have the military power to be able to take on all the forces in the world today which are ranged against Islam. Do you have that power? Do you have that power? About 20 years ago, in 1990, the Security Council of the United Nations wanted to adopt a resolution a resolution permitting the use of force against Saddam Hussein's Iraq 
This is the first war on Iraq. And uh, China was a member of the Security Council. And so was Yemen, so was Cuba. And so was uh, Malaysia. When the resolution came to vote, I think maybe Cuba and uh, Yemen voted no. And China probably abstained. All the Malay people in Malaysia, in Indonesia, in Singapore, in Brunei, were all, all, all supporting Saddam. All of them. Malaysian government voted in favor of the resolution. Dr. Mahathir explained. <laughs> he said, if we had voted against, or if we had abstained, upstate, they would have destroyed our economy. He was brutally honest and frank. Brutally honest and frank, Dr. Mahathir. You could not survive economically if you cross the line. <laughs> so do you have the military power to stand up to them when you don't even have the economic power? Huh? You can't continue to live in the comfort zone and stand up against them. No. You cannot restore Darul Islam today unless you restore the Khilafah. Tell me, unless the Zionists appoint your Khalifa for you, which they probably will do in Libya, and when they take over Syria, they do it in Syria. <laughs> unless the Zionists appoint the Khalifa, and the Zionists say this is Khilafa, <laughs> or the Zionists choose an Imam al-Mahdi and present him to us, that's the only way you can get Khilafa. You're living in dreamland. If you believe you have the power today to restore the Khilafah. The Khilafah can only be restored in my opinion. Because I have studied Ilmu Akhilul Zaman. When Imam al-Mahdi comes. Not before. And that may be another 20-25 years from now. Not only do you have international law preventing you from enforcing the Sharia you have more than that you have your national laws <laughs> if you make halal what Allah made haram what you're doing is legalizing that which is haram making it legal so my question to Ikhwan al Muslimun tonight did Allah make haram the lending of money on interest? Yes or no? Don't ask Al-Azhar University. That's the last place in the world you'd want guidance from on this matter. Don't ask Al-Azhar University. Did Allah make the lending of money on interest halal or haram? Answer? Haram. Is money being lent on interest today in Egypt? Do you have banks in Egypt? Come on, answer me. Yeah, you do. If you enforce the Sharia, will you still allow the banks to lend money on interest? Or will you have to stop them? You cannot enforce the Sharia and still have your banking system lending money on interest. Because then the whole world will laugh at you. What are the implications, therefore, of shutting down the banking industry, banking system? Have you ever thought about it, Ikhwan? Because if you allow money to be lent on interest, I believe you have banks in Malaysia as well, do you? Yes. You do? Yes. And Malaysian banks, they <laughs> lend money on interest, do they? Islamic, Islamic yeah. banking, non-Islamic banking. Yeah. So it is legal, right? It is not against the law. It is in conformity with the law. Yes. So you have made halal what Allah made haram. It's called the kafir. You made halal what Allah made haram. 
And that is shirk. This is being recorded. And therefore you are committing shirk. Not just Malaysia, around the world of Islam. So this is part of the problem of enforcing the Sharia in the modern age. You will have to deal with banking. You will have to deal with banking. You will have to deal with membership in the United Nations organization. But that's not all. There's something called the International Monetary Fund. And all countries in the world have to be members of the, United, of the International Monetary Fund. And if you are like Hugo Chavez in Venezuela, and you recognize it to be evil and exploitative, and you want to withdraw, the conditions of withdrawal are so terrible that Venezuela cannot withdraw. Yeah. It will be financially disastrous for Venezuela to withdraw. That's what you are. The whole world of Islam today is in the International Monetary Fund. Good. What are the implications of membership in the International Monetary Fund? And what are the implications of enforcement of the Sharia in a member state of the IMF? Number one. Even Dr. Mahathir was not aware. No, he wasn't aware. Question. Has Allah made dinar and dirham halal? Yes or no? You better say yes because dinar is in the Quran. Whether you are aware of it or you are not. I don't know if Ikhwan al-Muslim is aware of it. I have to raise my voice because it's not just anger, it's pain in my heart that the Khan has taken Egypt to civil war today because of recklessness on their part. Recklessness. Egypt is now in civil war. People are fighting each other in the masjid. In the masjid. In Salatul Jum'ah. Because of the recklessness of Ikhwan al Muslim. Dinar is in the Quran. Dirham is in the Quran. And a dinar in the Quran is not made of paper, it's made of gold. And a dirham is made of silver. Allah made it halal. It is also sunnah. All prophets of Allah use dinar and dirham. And tomorrow, Israel will be using dinar and dirham as money. And shame, shame, shame on the ummah of Muhammad alayhi salatu wa salam. Shame, shame, shame on the scholars of Islam. When Israel starts using dinar and dirham tomorrow, shame on the muftis, shame on you. May Allah take me away from the world. I don't want to live to see that day because the shame and the disgrace will be too great for me. But may Allah keep them alive to see that day. Those who today would not lift even a little finger to bring back dinar and dirham as money. Keep them alive. And take us away from the world. So we don't have to face that shame and disgrace. Allah made it halal. Dinar and dirham is money. What did the IMF do? Even Dr. Mahathir was not aware. The articles of agreement of the International Monetary Fund has prohibited the use of gold as money. Haram. <laughs> so they have made haram what Allah made halal. Is that shirk? You better answer that question before you reach your grave. Eh? Yeah. And if you follow it and accept it, 
And you say that the money which comes out of the IMF, which is the ringgit, the paper ringgit that you have, came out of the IMF, that this is halal money. You also part of the shirk. This is not the time. I have a lecture outside entitled Islam and the International Monetary System. You can get it outside the, the video or you can go on the internet and you can listen to it. I have a book entitled The Gold Dinar and Silver Dirham Islam and the Future of Money. You can read that book. We have it in Bahasa as well, outside. And I have a lecture which I just delivered at the conference on Riba uh, a week and a half ago on Islam, the petrodollar and beyond which explains the subject in greater detail. The lecture is also on my website. So we don't have the time to explain. If you want to enforce the Sharia, you have to withdraw from the IMF. <laughs> huh? You have to withdraw from the IMF. Why? Because the IMF articles of agreement prohibit the use of gold as money. And therefore they have made haram what Allah made halal. But that's not all. There's more to it than that. In the Quran Allah has prohibited ripping off people. Three times in the Quran he has said, Don't rip off people. <laughs> How do you rip them off? By diminishing the value of what they have. Their property, their wage, their belongings. As the value of your money falls, everything else is falling. I am a writer. I earn my livelihood, alhamdulillah, from my books. So nobody can fire me. So I have the freedom to speak. <laughs> I published Jerusalem in the Quran, which is my bestseller, in 2002. Two, so 10 years ago right here in Malaysia and at that time we fixed the price at 35 ringgits and I could have sold four copies and bought a dinar 10 years ago did you hear that? good after 10 years, we raised the price from 35 to 40. But now I have to sell about 25 copies to buy one dinar. Do you understand what has happened to your ringgit? I sold four copies, I could buy one ringgit. One dinar. Four copies, I could buy one dinar. 10 years later, Increase the price to 40. I have to sell about 20 25 copies to buy one dinar. That's where your ringgit is falling in value. And your case is not as bad as Indonesia, it's not as bad as Pakistan, it's not as bad as uh, Bangladesh, it's not as bad as Egypt. As the value of the paper money falls, the people become poorer and poorer. Money that Allah created doesn't fall in value. Because the value of the money is in the money. It has intrinsic value. That's why the IMF prohibited the use of gold as money. Why? Because they want you to be imprisoned with this paper money. They used to have paper and printing press and ink to create money. That's all you needed to create money. You need paper, you need a printing press, and you need ink. 
and you could make money out of thin air. Who is Imran Hussein to say that? Oh, Imran Hussein has studied international monetary economics, so he knows what he's talking about. Oh yes, he knows the subject. They don't teach the subject in the Darul Ulum, international monetary economics, no. And that's why our muftis give fatwa without a knowledge of the subject. In 1971, the United States reneged on its obligations under international law to redeem US dollars for gold. And from that day to this day, it's only paper. When they print their paper, it's called hard currency. So you can have a US dollar anywhere in the world. You could go to Indonesia, you could go to Bandung, you can buy what you want with US dollars. So it's very advantageous for them to print paper and buy all the oil in Saudi Arabia. It doesn't cost anything except the paper and the ink. <laughs> but when we print paper, we the donkeys, because we are donkeys, we have a load of books on our backs. Says Allah. Donkeys with a load of books on our backs. We print the paper. And we go to Manhattan, Midtown, no, no, lower Manhattan where you have Wall Street. And we take a whole suitcase filled with Bangladeshi taka. Can't even buy a cup of coffee. That's why we are donkeys. Hmm? If you can't understand that this is bogus and fraudulent and haram, you should buy a one-way ticket and go to the moon. But Bank Negara will never say that it's bogus and haram. And the Muftis will never say it's bogus and haram. Hmm? But Dr. Mahathir explained something to us recently. And remember Dr. Mahathir is not an alim. He's a politician. He's a secular politician. He's a nationalist. He's not an ustaz. <laughs> no, he's not an alim. And he pointed out they don't need to print paper anymore. He says all that the Federal Reserve has to do now, and only the Federal Reserve can do it, no other central bank can do it, is write a check. <laughs> for seven trillion dollars, seven trillion dollars and just send the check to the banking system and that enters into the books of the banks and when the bank lends the money to you Egypt IMF loan and you sign the agreement for the loan now it becomes money now it becomes money so they are creating money out of thin air but a much faster rate than they did it with printing paper because imagine says Dr. Mahathir how many security vehicles you will need to take seven trillion dollars hmm? how many printing press will have to print for how many months to print seven trillion dollars now it's easy you just write a check and then when the bank lends the money, it's not going to be lending seven trillion dollars, you know. It's something called, what is it called? Fractional, eh? Fractional Reserve Banking. That term came straight out of Jahannam. Fractional reason. We might have a banker here who would agree with me. Meaning, you take the, in, the money which is created out of thin air and you multiply it several times. If I have 100 ringgits, I'm a bank, I can lend 1,000 or more. Called fractional reserve banking. So this is bogus upon bogus. Fraudulent upon fraudulent, haram upon haram. If you want to enforce the Sharia in Egypt, Ikhwan al-Muslimun, 
what's going to happen to the Egyptian pound? Did you even ask the question before you went to your referendum? The Egyptian pound is bogus, it's fraudulent, it's haram. And it has functioned as 